Welcome to this edition of Association Chat, which is your weekly online discussion for the association community where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire with thought leaders and trailblazers alike to join up in this online home for the community. I'm your host, Kiki Latalian. I'm the CEO of Amplified Growth Digital Marketing and host of this weekly chat that has been around since 2009 on Twitter, on Blab, and now huzzah. So I, I just want to say something, you know, every week we have interesting people on the show. We have a chance to talk with all of you and we learn something new. This week I'm really, really excited because not only do we have, you know, two back-to-back -back awesome episodes today, but then we also are talking about some really important things with some people who know an incredible amount about them. I've been trying to get JP to join me on association chat for a few months now. And so uh, this is really going to be a lot of fun for me. And I hope it's a lot of fun for all of you. But I want you to ask yourselves, have you been worried about your revenue? Uh, your approach to organizational growth may have hit a wall. That may be the case. And the chances are that some of you may be needing to have some kind of candid evaluation with, with your approach, with uh, what you're doing to bring in new members, how you're keeping your existing members happy. This may mean new tactics. This may mean new, stra new strategies. And if that's the case, I have the person for you to talk to. Our guest for this association chat is JP Murray. He's the president of the Murray Company and his company has been involved in membership sales for roughly six years, six plus years. And the processes that they've used have evolved over time. So I want you to welcome JP. JP, thank you so much. And oh, I can't wait thank to you. hear about oh, all the ways it. that you can help people. This is awesome. I'm excited about it. All right. So I want to ask you something, you know, we've worked a little bit together in the past and i know that that you are all about you know moving straight to the hard hitting good stuff you want to just cut to the chase so first and foremost if you were launching a membership growth campaign what mm. would be your first three steps what would your first uh -huh. three <laughs> yeah, that's a great are you that ready to go <laughs> yeah that's a great question okay so so here's what I would do first. First of all, and, and this came out of an evaluation of we're going to make about a quarter of a million calls this year for our clients selling membership and, and some and sponsorships, too. And I asked the team, you know, what's the number one factor of a great partnership? Mm -hmm. The number one thing that they said was, how good is the data? How good is the list? If the list is no good, if you don't, if you're a trade association and you don't have multiple contacts within that organization, for example, or you don't have current data on that prospect, you're, I don't care how good your sales team is, they're not going to be successful or they won't be as successful as they could be. Mm. So I, I tell you, we're, we're focusing a lot of time on data, on list development, on research, through social media, LinkedIn, even on just using the internet to provide information about our prospects. Because first and foremost, that is the number one thing. The second thing is, and I think associations, we've kind of been in this for a long time, and heavens, I've been with associations where we where I made the mistake. Now, I'll say it this way. It's not about the benefits or the products that you sell. It's about the problems that you solve. Mm. OK, so a lot. So what I'm asking the associations to do, secondly, is to make it about the prospect. It's the outside in. It's not the inside out. So think about the problems that you solve for clients or prospects in terms of advocacy, professional development, networking and uh, business development contacts for your members and come up with specific reasons or stories, authentic stories from your members about how the association helped them solve problems. Because believe me, they're going to be attracted more to that rather than 
you know, the 10 reasons to join brochure that we've all developed, right? So that's the second thing. And the third thing is content marketing is fabulous. So many associations are about the content that they have, about the white papers they have on position issues, about what uh, HR 2532 could do to the associate, to the industry. Mm -hmm. That content supported by direct sales is the way we're selling today. So, right, it's not sending out the membership or the sponsorship prospectus. It's identifying one piece of content, seeing who clicks onto that information because they're the most interested. That's who we call. Right. So that and you got so that brings us full circle, right? You have to have the data to make that happen. Yeah. Data. It's about the problems you solve, not the products and benefits you provide. And then thirdly, content marketing supported by direct sales. And that means somebody on the phone directly contacting your prospects. That those are the three things I would start with right away if I was selling a new program. I love it. And see, you know, there you have it. It's like one, two, three, immediate value. And I just want a quick shout out to the people who are commenting over uh, here in the chat box who are watching live. That's some of the best parts of, of association chat, being able to have this, this fresh feedback. Oh, and yeah. uh, Helen from Team Sliceworks, great point about reevaluating your membership data. And Patty, Patty Lehman, you know, I. Oh, yeah. I know. It's great to see you, Patty. She says, so yeah. true. It's about the person joining, solve their problems. So my second question to you is, what is the biggest mistake that organizations are making that you're seeing out there in membership recruitment today? Yeah. So <laughs> this kind of follows up on that theme, Kiki. I mean, the associations, we've got to break out of this thing where it's all about the association. Or it's all about the industry. How many times do you see associations position themselves this way? Hey, we want you to join so you can be part of the industry, so you can be a part of the association. Let me tell you, the people that buy into that part of the value proposition, you already have them. Mm -hmm. Those people that want to support the industry, support the association, if you lead with that, they don't care. They don't care about the industry. They don't care about the association necessarily. They care about the things that you're going to help them with. So one thing that I want to, I want to, I'm not sure it's a mistake, but I want to reposition them a little bit. We talk a lot about the free riders in membership. Oh, it's so frustrating because they're, you know, they're taking advantage of the things that we do. Well, we've made it so. And you know why? Because we say the first thing we say is, Oh, we're speaking on behalf of the widget manufacturing industry. Oh, great. Keep doing that because I'm not going to pay you. Right. So I want to make it about the members that we represent, mm -hmm. not the entire industry, the members mm -hmm. and the problems that we solve for them. So if there's something that I really get fired up about is, and by the way, I very much dislike and I very much dislike free riders. Right. I don't like the folks that say, oh, we support what you do. Uh, we support what you do. We're a big fan. Stop right there. No, you no, you don't. Right. No, right. the people, the people that support us are the people that join. And that's who I'm fighting for every single day. And that's what we want you to be a part of. And if you choose not to, you're going to be you're going to be missing. You're not going to have a seat at the table. We don't know how we're going to represent you on Capitol Hill because we know nothing about your business. Yeah. So single most single uh, single thing that I'd like folks to focus on is how you are helping the members succeed in business, not the industry. Because I think that actually can help you undermine this free rider mentality that exists out there. And there really is. I mean, I think with with so many different ways that people can participate in the industry, so to speak, you know, and, and can go out, they can network online, they can do all kinds of different things. They feel like maybe they don't need to, maybe they don't need to join. And that it does, you know, it does put the onus on, on the associations to figure out, okay, well, you know, how is it, how are you proving your value to them so that they, it is a priority for them to become a member. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I mean, people, you've heard this over and over again. I mean, if you listen to Tony Robbins or Zig Ziglar, right? I mean, it is people will change their behavior only if they have enough pleasure or pain mm -hmm. that they recognize. Mm -hmm. So our job is to help them find that kind of pleasure or pain by being a part of the institution. Pleasure, I'm going to get new clients. Pain there could be a new regulation that comes out of California, by the way, that happens to everybody yep. <laughs> and it's going to knock out my business. Yeah. Right. So I think that's the opportunity. And, and one other thought there is what we're finding increasingly, it is usually one thing that moves that purchase or that member joining. It's not 20. It's not the 10 things you can talk to the person before they hang up the phone on you. It's the one thing that we can maybe learn through content marketing that they are interested in. And if I'm calling you, Kiki, that's all I'm talking about yeah. Yeah. is that one thing, not the 20, not the 10, because actually that means the other nine things that I'm going to try to tell you about, you're driving down the value of membership. I want to talk about the one thing that may be your pain point or the problem we can solve. I love it. I, love I think it. that that's I really, that's uh, really uh, ooh, I hear a bit of an echo. All right. Um, here we go. I keep hearing it. Okay. So I'm going to move ahead and hopefully that will, that will solve itself. Um, there's been a lot of sponsorship activity with your company. I've seen it in a lot of associations. This is a question that a lot of association executives have is mm -hmm. what to do about sponsorships or how to make sponsorships better, how to make them compelling for people to want to be sponsors. You've been very involved with that. that. Are there trends that you're seeing when it comes to sponsorships? Uh, oh, oh, no, no doubt. And, and I think it gets down to this. Uh, part of a lot of times when we work with uh, organizations to build a new prospectus for them, we will actually interview the the sponsors about what they like about the program, what they would change, what they've learned from other organizations that have worked for them. And so uh, first and foremost, I would do that with your sponsors mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis, right? Um, here are the three things that I would, that I think are trends or we're definitely seeing. And that's this one, the sponsors want you to help them solve their business objectives. They're not there to underwrite, your food and beverage costs, right? So, right, I mean, nobody put the, the, the coffee break together as a great <laughs> sponsorship, right? It wasn't a big business development opportunity. It was actually probably because the sponsorships were being sold in the meetings department yeah. and they wanted to underwrite the costs. Okay, well, that's the way it is. But here are the trends. One, they want to be thought leaders and content providers. Mm -hmm i.e. they want to speak. They want time at the podium. They want to deliver a white paper. And oh, by the way, I've been in this game for 35 years now almost, and nobody died over that. Yeah. I mean, come, I mean, really. I mean, there we've probably seen the example where someone overplayed their time at the mic. But if you give them some good standard operating procedures, I think they can do a very, they would be great in providing content and thought leadership to your audience. Here's why. They probably know more about the widget manufacturing industry than the members in the audience yeah. do in yeah. many cases because they're touching different people. So that's one. The second thing is um, they want to connect with their key accounts. So I want to facilitate meetings between my sponsors and some of the people that they want to meet. And you know, what's, you know what we hear a lot of the time is the association will go, oh, well, we do that already. Oh, yeah, but you're not monetizing it, <laughs> right? So put it in the sponsorship package. That's number two. So it's content, content leadership. It's uh, facilitation of business meetings. And then third, they want to do some branding with you, right? But they want to do it more mobile, more apps, more social media, mm -hmm. have somebody sponsor the Twitter feed for the entire meeting. That's the kind of thing that they're looking for. And I would say, and I would say this, 
I think if you're developing a sponsorship program right now, I'm getting fired up about this. <laughs> about it. If you're doing this, it should do three things. It should help fulfill some kind of need of the association, i.e. .e., programming and money back to the association. It should help the sponsor achieve some kind of business objective. That's number two. And the third, the member experience is better because of that. Mm -hmm. So if I'm developing a new prospectus, folks, I would really think about, does that sponsorship program help me fulfill those three things? One, the association is going to benefit. Two, the sponsor is going to gain some kind of business objective. Three, the member experience at the meeting or the event or overall in their membership value prop improves because of the sponsorship program that's in place. That's what I would do today. You know, what do you think that, what do you think is holding people back from actually taking that step, you know, from hey, getting more creative? Yeah. Hey, so probably I think it's this. Uh, one is there is concern because if they, you know, pull the tablecloth out from underneath the banquet table, everybody's going to freak out. <laughs> And so, right. So, so I would say keep some of the legacy stuff in place. Hey, if someone's been sponsoring the lanyard for ten years, let them do it. I, mean, I think it's a waste of money, but get, let them do it. Yeah. That's fine. Um, but then insert some new things that some some new content leadership opportunities for folks that want to provide that, and you'll start to learn that they'll gravitate towards those things. I think that is, I think it's the concern that everyone's going to migrate to something else or they're not going to like it. So keep some of the legacy stuff in place, but insert some new gradually. I would say one other thing, and that is that um, in launching these kinds of programs, the sponsors really want a full on year round opportunity. Yes. Most of our, right, so most of our organizations, even when I get pitched on stuff, right, it's a one-off. Hey, if it's a good idea for me to be in front of that marketplace for the three days during the annual meeting, what's the rest of the 360, what are the 362 days? Mm -hmm. What are we going to yeah. do here? And so if you can get out in front and have those conversations actually right now, you know, the beginning of the fourth quarter, you can maybe get some new business, some new revenue, and you got it, but you've got to launch it right now because what's going to happen? If you if you roll this out in January, people are going to go, yeah, I can see me next year because I've already spent my money. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's so fun. That's I, so I mean, fun. I know that I just uh, saw that you had put out a great blog post. By the way, anyone who's watching this, you need to follow this man. If you're not following him, he has a great blog, uh, a great podcast. Great regular posts, live, he posts live to Thank Facebook you. and just really great content on a regular basis. You're welcome. But, you know, one of the things that you just posted recently had to do with how to make sure that you have a fantastic fourth quarter and really going into it and knowing that you're, you're going to make a difference with it. And so I, I want to bring that up because I think that that's something that people should go to if you want some more information about how JP's mind works and how you can get ahead for your fourth quarter. But then um, also be thinking about that as you're coming to, you know, up with your questions for JP, because like I said, that's the benefit of listening to something like this live is you're able to ask questions right now um, while we're here, while he's here with you. So be thinking, okay, sure. how can I make a difference right now? How can I make a difference going into the fourth quarter? Yeah. Hey, you know what? I would challenge somebody. Put down, type out your number one objection that you get from a prospective member or sponsor. Send it over and let's let's kind of let's figure this thing out and get them in the hot box and take care of it. I love that idea. So you heard the man. So you type it in. You think about it. What's the number one objection that you get? It's the number one problem that you face. But number one objection that you get, and we'll we'll talk about it live right now um, and get it out on there. The yeah, right on the spot. So I love that. Uh, we have a question from Twitter. Lara says, should you let your members cross post? Oh, that's interesting. Do you let your members cross post? 
I guess that's with any kind of communication. I'm not sure if they had anything posted yeah. about, like on, on social media, I guess. Or... Oh, probably maybe. A, well, let me to make the assumption that it's across maybe the, uh, the different platforms that you may be offering people to engage. Right. Hey, I, I think this. Um, and I'm actually encouraging associations to go absolutely, especially if you're a small association, I'm all in on social, mm -hmm. right? I'm not printing anything. I mean, we're recruiting more members maybe than any other company around right now. I mean, somebody else proved me wrong. And I'm telling you, we're not sending out any membership brochures. We're not mailing any prospectuses out to people. It's based on content. It's digital. It's providing links to great information that they would get if they were a member. So I would say this around cross posting, the genie's out of the bottle folks. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's just go ahead and open this baby up because um, <laughs> it, I mean, it's already out there. The, the, the challenge for associations that they're going to be able to control messaging and control what their members say is just that's that's done yeah so long long answer to short question i don't yeah, know but, lara can you share that can you help uh help this person on twitter uh with that and and we're going to move on i want to talk a little bit about something that's a hot topic in the association space it has been for as long as i've been around but but you know whether we're looking at a freemium model whether we're looking at pay to play tiered tiered models there's been and always has been this this huge discussion about membership dues levels, but now there are more options than ever before with the way that you can go. And sure. um, we're looking at things like uh, what should we do with our members package? And and now that you know we have different types of technology, different types of communication, how, what kind of impact does that have on our member structure? So, you know, what do you what do you see in all of that? Oh, oh, wow. So I, my guess is at any given time right now, we're conducting anywhere from three to four dues evaluations and membership reviews. Mm -hmm. Here's what I've seen. Trade associations offering more individual membership organization types of benefits, including individual memberships. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then individual membership organizations offering more corporate packages and acting, having some behaviors that look more like trade associations. What I would encourage people to do is, and what we see with some great associations, frankly, is that, you know, you're always chasing for that four to five percent increase every decade, right? The fact of the matter is that most dues models were constructed by some very well-meaning uh, dead white men in a smoke filled room 50 years ago. <laughs> and it has very little to do with value, right? But what I would encourage these associations to do is look holistically at the business model when they're addressing dues. So what I mean by that is, it, let's say it's a trade association. By company, what are they paying in dues? What are they paying in non dues revenue programs? Which meetings are they participating in? Which committees are they involved with, right? And get a more comprehensive look at what the membership value might be for them. My experience is that's when you start to see the clusters of new benefits and maybe tier pricing tiers that may be more appropriate for the business model of today. Okay. Mm -hmm. So look at the entire business before you just say, Okay, we haven't raised dues in 10 years. Let's get a 5% increase. That's not based on any kind of strategy. Right. The numbers are going to give you, so the numbers are going to tell you and lead you the way that you need to go or give you the options. I want to say one thing about free membership, though. Go find me an association that is effective on Capitol Hill, that has an ongoing sustainable model can advocate on their members and do the types of things that many of your associations can with a free model. It's easy to talk about in a chat room. It's easy to talk about on a message board, but I want to see the proofs in the pudding. Mm 
Okay, that's I've the challenge, it. guys. That's another yeah, challenge. Yeah, so, <laughs> hey, I'm all open to it. I'm all open to it. He but I'd rather go. Pitch, I'd rather go pitch the guy and and have the experience in it. I'd rather go pitch the guy for a hundred and fifty thousand dollar membership that has a big dang problem in California with the regulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, but that's my bias. And so when we develop these and work to develop these new dues models, I want to run it through the context of, can you sell it or not? Right. 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 Yeah. And so, I was, so there's some good stuff ha happening over in the chat. And for the people listening on the podcast later down the road, see what you're missing because you don't get to see all this stuff on the side. And this is why you need to turn, tune in live. But uh, Benji Craig, who was our guest a little um, like a week or two ago, uh, said that print is dead, but personalized handwritten notes are still gold. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then Carolyn said, what strategy? This is a question for you. What strategy would you suggest for getting members to update their contact information? Ah, uh, Great. So yeah. this kind of goes in this kind of goes into the membership engagement area. OK, so let me let me take this on a re real quick for you. Okay. So a, as we develop um, strategic marketing plans to actually do the things to bring the member in and get them signed up, I think you need that, that's it just doesn't stop there. Right. So I, I used to be I mean, I've, I've done it before. Right. Oh, gosh, we got them. They joined. Let's put them on the list and start sending a bunch of crap to them. Okay, so what I'm challenging you to do, to do now on the engagement side, which I think has something to do with the updating of the contact information, uh -huh. right, is set up a 12-month engagement program to get them to provide you information, to fill out surveys about what they're most interested in, to actively contact, actively contact, members about what is concerning them or how they can help that is and you complement that with some of the new AMSs I think that have ways for you to actively reach out and get people to fill out their information so I think it's a part of an a 12 month engagement process once you sell them to get them active in the association including keeping their data updated yeah yeah, I, I mean, I, I think and I can see how collecting the different pieces of information along the way would would help from, to, to avoid overload at one time, like trying to like inundate them with fill out five pages of a form to like yeah. get this information. But um, but it is a challenge and to be that structured and organized, I think, is is a challenge as well. I give a quick a quick story, Kiki. That a, a great association. They've been a client for a long time. Um, we started going through the engagement process with them, and they had a, I think it's a bi bi monthly magazine for an example. So one of the first things you would get. So we started mapping it out. Hey, when they join, what happens? Mm -hmm. Okay, then what happens? Okay, what then? Then what happens? And we started doing this for like the whole year. Depending upon, and I encourage you all to do this, because what we found was if they didn't just get at the right time when they joined, the first thing they received was the magazine. Well, okay, they could wait 60 days to get the magazine because the magazine also had the welcome letter with it, right? So 60-day gap, if you didn't join at the right time, signaled you're probably going to lose that person. Right, because they've got to get engaged in the first sixty days. So I had a, I had my my colleague here at home, which is a little poodle, was like completely going insane in the background. So I had to turn off my mic. Right. That's the challenges of doing this, you know, every week. So it's, it's live broadcast. Yeah, I know. So, um, so there have been some really interesting things that have been posted here while you were while you were talking. And I wanted to just um, say that Patty brought up the fact that even AARP charges dues. And Susan said that CompTIA is a good example of, uh, you know, an organization that 
that still is productive, makes money, and that kind of thing. But they have certification income, well, she says, which is they have cert- oh, sure. They they're engaging people as customers, and also as members. They, in fact, I, my recollection is CompTIA has you know a number of different membership segments that they offer now. That doesn't mean that you don't engage people with specific products and programs that will get them interested in the overall association. I'm not saying that it's, I've learned that the hard way. It's not a members, members only scenario here, Mm -hmm. but I still think that membership dues can certainly, and it looks like, you know, 60% of the revenue for most trade associations is being generated that way. And to completely say that that model is dead. I don't know. Right. I don't buy yeah so so and then there's also andrew calhoun asked a question which i think he's having a birthday today so happy 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 birthday birthday. um and if not happy birthday anyway uh how to get members back who have unsubscribed due to the volume on emails from different departments ah so well i wouldn't contact them by email as a starter. Um, but I think the overriding thing here is email. I saw something the other day that email is the number of the number of emails being sent doubles every hundred days or something like that. 65% of all people admit to reading email during a business meeting. 70% of all people admit to reading email in bed. I want to be a part of that disruptive technology. <laughs> I mean, I'm in on email. In fact, in our sales process now, we're starting to find that email, it's about a 50-50 component between email and direct calls that we're making for membership sales. Yeah. So because they're, they are leaving because of too many bad emails, mm-hmm. emails that are about the association, emails that continue to send the early bird discount for the annual meeting, right? Right. right. A more thoughtful process of engaging them with emails, a home run. It's the wasteful self promotion emails that are ruining, that could be ruining the membership experience here. And I would say one thing about handwritten notes. I just got an, I just got a handwritten note from a young lady that played on my softball team. Mm. I've been coaching for like 10 years. Wow. You want to talk about a differentiator. I've, I've had like three notes sent to me over the 10 years I've been coaching ball. That's probably about the number I deserve, right? <laughs> but, but the point is, I will never forget that young lady. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's a it's a it's a classy move, and it's something that is it really stands out, especially now more than ever before. I think it was always a good idea, but now it's so unusual to get something like that. You know, I I save those things. It's much different than getting an email, even which emails are nice, but you get so many that you know. Well, it's differentiation. It's yeah. what it is. Yeah, it's a differentiator. Well, you know, there's something that you mentioned about um, you were talking about the communication and making sure that you're not inundating people with uh, communication that they don't care about, which is like the early bird and that kind of stuff. And we know those. We've all been a part of those. And um, I know that your company, for example, the, the communication that you put out, one of your strengths is that you regularly put out unique, fresh content. That, that is distinctive and provides value to people, very focused on that. And I wondered if maybe you could share w- what your what your thoughts are on how, how you guide your ship. I mean, how did you put together your communication so that, well, so that it would be impactful? Well, you helped me with that. So I appreciate it. <laughs> I wasn't, I, it wasn't a softball. It was, it was a, <laughs> oh my God, what are you doing? Um, you know, and, and my colleague, Kim Gillum, yeah. uh, really helps drive our communications effort. And I think it makes us look larger. Um, so I, I would say this, we learned something about, about four years, uh, three years ago, 
the difference in engagement with readers um, on original content in contrast to um, summarized or aggregated content. So when we did our newsletter, we go out to a couple thousand people every week, right? We started to see the number of clicks on content that we may have aggregated from Smart Brief or ASAE or from, from anybody. And it was a fraction of what the clicks were on our own content that we developed. Now, so here's how we do it. I'll, I'll give you the recipe right now. Kim, Kim and I get together and I do a riff on a topic for about, I don't know, Kim, probably two to three minutes. She will develop that into a blog almost verbatim, but she's got to watch my language. So <laughs> okay, you, right? she'll Good type it you. out. She'll <laughs> type it out. That goes into a blog post. Mm -hmm. Often I will also be recording a podcast at the same time. That becomes the content for a blog. It becomes content for the newsletter. And then I've got that blog and then I Facebook live that. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we're we're actually you know on a twelve person company, and on the com on the communication side, it's just Kim and myself. So we're going to scale one piece of content four or five times. Yeah. And then using Hootsuite or whatever platform you want to use, we're going to resend that several times because we learned this at Smart Brief, and I don't think it's a, a trade secret or every, anything. But most people are reading emails between 10 and 11.30, okay? So when that happens, if you don't catch them during that window, like 80% of our opens happen within the first hour of our distribution of the content. Mm -hmm. So once that's over, it might as well not have happened. So I've got to go back and circle around to those people again. So leveraging that content over and over again and scaling it is the way to get, I think, valuable information out than just, you know, a standard marketing piece over and over again. Right, right. And I want, I actually want to, um, you know, just one thing on that is that when you say that you, you use that content over and over, a lot of the time what you're doing is you're actually taking that content and you're not just taking it in the same Format and slapping it into a different channel, you're actually reworking it so that you're taking maybe oh. the points out of or or you're riffing on it live when you have already created the blog post. And so it is unique each time or it is tailored to the audience based on the channel that is being um, that's being used. Very true. That that and that's something we also learn from you is the how to, you know, when I started early on in this, I would post I would just take one piece of content and post it the same way across Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera. I found over time that it doesn't work that way. It needs to be reframed for the right, you know, for the right, for the right platform, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I just, you know, I appreciate the, the content that you're regularly putting out. One of the things that I, um, I personally have benefited from is being able to learn from you uh, the things that you're sharing as you go along about the way that you've put your business together and the way that you sort of the way you're thinking on on business and um, you know communication and just all kinds of things. So you launched your companies over six years ago. What kind of advice do you have for association business owners out there? You know, and I'd, I'd be happy to continue to talk with people about this that are in the space. Uh, I think one of the things that's been most helpful is that I'm very comfortable in just telling, being authentic about the content. Yeah. I mean, so here's one for you. It's a little bit of a joke, and then I'll actually get to the answer. The top, the top, the top, Red. <laughs> you, have, you have to get past the laughing to actually tell the truth. Yeah. yeah. So the blog that was read the most was where I put in the blog the five biggest business mistakes I've ever made, or something like that. Uh -huh. So you have to be. I I think you have to be vulnerable. That is interesting. You have. 
I screw up all the time. No. I think in the association <laughs> no. world, I think in the association world, there's this whole, you know, it's like the Washington, D.C., um, you know, reception racket where we're all going to places telling about how we're kicking butt. And everybody's got challenges. Yeah. So are you willing to talk about them? Okay. That attracts people to you. Yeah. And, and, and oh, by the way, it's the truth, right? So I would say about launching the business, um, number one thing, it's the hustle. It's the hustle. Mm -hmm. How bad do you want it? I, I wrote a blog post about this a while back. Are you going to burn the bridges? Like I'm in this business, not until I can get another association gig. This is it. This is the last one, right? I'm not looking back. So that really made me hustle and really put out, at least for me, the most effort I can. And I think there's an entrepreneurial spirit in the association world that really needs a catalyst. Okay. I think, I think we can churn, I think we can churn it out and burn it up a little bit harder. The second thing is differentiation. I mean, I talked about it earlier for us. I mean, we'll do a business review, but I'm going to run it from the perspective of we sell things too. So I'm not going to give you advice on a dues model that I don't think people can sell. Yeah. So that's our differentiation. So what is yours? And then finally, here's something that I'm, we talked about getting the right clients, get the right clients. And here's what I'm going to do. And I, and you can hold me accountable. I'm going to ask for a referral from the association for a vendor that they've worked with before. Okay. Right. So they always get, Hey, tell me about the three people that you worked with. Okay. I will give me three vendors that you worked with. Cause I want to talk to them about you. I mean, because I think we can get, we need to, the association folks are our partners. Yeah. I don't want to be in a one down position. Yeah. I, you know, we have something to offer. We've got some connections to make here and I want it to be equal footing. I, I'm not I love, a, I actually, that's kind of interesting. I've never really thought about it that way, but it's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely a fair point, you know? Well, uh, hopefully I didn't upset a lot of association folks. <laughs> But my, my, my angle on this is we're going to collaborate and work together. And I mean, we want to be an extension of your team. So in a way, I kind of want to know what your culture is with people like me. I think that's fair. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I'm fascinated, though, fascinated by uh, the conversation that is and is not happening over here on the side because all of a sudden everyone – you know, there was no like, you, people stopped typing in, and I don't think it's because they're not interested. I think it's because, I think it's because they're thinking, really thinking about what you were talking about. Something that really captured me was uh, what you said about looking for a catalyst in that regard for um, that spirit of entrepreneurship in the association space, and you know, thinking about it, we talk about it all the time. You know, associations are known to be risk averse and, you know, whether that's because so many of them are tied into advocacy work or, you know, you know, maybe even connected to government where, you know, there's a hierarchy that's there. Um, I think it's interesting that you're saying this because I think that in a lot of ways that has held associations back and is also you know, it, it also takes the association executive and it makes them seem like just by default that they're not cutting edge and they're not forward thinking and they're not innovative just because they're in an association. And that's not true. Right. But, you know, it is it is true that a lot of us are more risk averse than we should be. When it, yeah. So, yeah. So I think, I mean, there's no doubt that we are not, we are not businesses. If you're in the association space, I get that. Um, we, we can't go raise cap. Well, we are not, we aren't able to raise capital like a startup might be able to. Right. 
Um, we are not rewarded by an IPO or some launch of our stock. However, our members don't really care about that. I mean, that's, yeah. I don't think that they care about that. So we've got to break out of some of those restrictions or lack of incentives in the spirit of serving them and solving their problems better than ever before. So that's the entrepreneurial aspect that I'm, that I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. That's great stuff. So how are you feeling over there, everyone? Is this resonating with you? Are you, is this making you, is this lighting you up? Is this making you think of some questions to ask? Uh, Helen says that we're listening. Great value here. Thank you. And, uh, and says Twitter is buzzing. Carolyn says associations are risk averse. Yes. And Andrew says you'll get everything in life you want. if You'll just help you enough have, other people get what they want from Zig Ziglar. So um, excellent. Stuff. You know, I, I want to remind people about this personal contact and how important it is. And I'll give you a piece of advice that I learned from Red Cavaney when he was at API. I was interviewing him. I can't remember. I can't remember what the thing was. I was at the chamber and he was the chairman of the committee of 100. And obviously he's a king in the association world. Um, and he had a stack of three by five cards on his desk. I said, so tell me about that. He said, well, he said, these are my board members. And, and he takes it and every month he would work through all of those three by five cards and make just a personal call. Oh my gosh, hey, I, I love that. About, I hey, love that so trip? much. How'd the fishing trip go? You know, it, it sometimes it was about business. Sometimes he had an agenda and an item that he needed to cover with the board, but he had a repetition and really a system and a process in place to call and then put him at the bottom of the deck. And sometimes he only left a message because he couldn't reach the person. But that kind of thoughtful engagement that you might be able to make with your uh, with your members or some of your leaders could be really helpful in a in an age that I fully embrace in this digital aspect of it, but keeping that personal touch at the same time. I absolutely love that idea. You know, I have I have a, a list of people that I want to get together with for you know, coffee. And that this was, this was me moving into that direction where it's like, oh, I need to get together with them for some reason. But what if we just had, you know, what if you just put together a list, you know, as we're approaching 2017, as we're going into, you know, the fourth quarter, what if you made sure that you had that list where you had like the, the 15, you know, top people that you really want to connect with on a regular basis, that it means a whole lot to you to develop those relationships and just worked on that. I love that idea. JP, oh my gosh, this is great stuff. You just share a story. You share a story and, and it's amazing. Um, is, what do you guys think? Are you thinking the same thing? I see that Helen wrote over here from uh, Team Sliceworks. Having a system or process is key to making any strategy or new effort work. So that's absolutely true. Um, so as we are nearing the end of our hour, it's a little bit early, but it's, a, it's an interesting time because we do have back-to-back -back episodes today. So I want to, to bring it together and, you know, I just want to ask you, JP, um, if there's one bit of insight, if there's if there's one piece of advice that you would like to give everyone today, uh, our audience today, uh, as they go out and they go about doing their jobs, what would you what would you say? Yeah. Wow. Sorry. I was, <laughs> Sorry. You know, that, no, it's a great question. Yeah. I tell you what, I am a, I'm a big advocate of revenue growth because the more if you've got the cash you can make the dash as tom donahue used to say to us and who is responsible in your association or your company for new revenue new members new clients new sponsors what is what's the data that they have in place to go get those people what are the what what's the process in place to to go do it 
And do you have the content that will help bring them on board? That is, I'm, somebody needs to be in charge of it. Yeah. And uh, that's what I really encourage folks to, uh, to maybe think about today is where, where do we get the new clients? Where do we get the new members? Where do we get the new sponsors? And setting up a plan and a process to go do that. I love it. You know, this is fantastic, but I, I have to see, you know, you have to agree to come back on sometime because oh, sure. one hour isn't enough. Even 50 minutes isn't enough. So everyone, thank you for joining us for this week's association chat episode one, because we are flip, you know, going to go over to another episode. I really want to thank our, our special guest, JP Murray, for lending us his time and his expertise. Thank you so much. And if you want to stay with us, if you want to go to the next chat, we're going to be talking about how data powers next generation membership. And that's with Joe Colangelo and Susan Cato, who actually participated in this chat. You may have seen her a little bit before. Um, she's the director of digital strategy and member services for the American Society of Plant Biologists. So that's going to be a lot of fun. I hope that you've had a good time with this chat and that you've learned something that will help you now or in the future. If you like us, please share us with your friends or join us on the Association Chat Facebook group for regular updates, upcoming topics, finding out more about the speakers. Stick around for the next episode. It's happening in just a few minutes, but you're going to have to change the URL. So if you need to go to associationchat.com to pick up the next one, go ahead and do that or look on Twitter, follow at Association Chat at and chat and you'll see what that that url is jp thank you so much and for all of you who can't stay with us we'll see you next time thank you thank you